How's it going boys, Razim here for Astrophotography and in today's Night Sky video, it is the Night Sky in August. So how the Night Sky videos work, if you're new here, is this is a curated list of deep sky objects, planets, meteor showers, events, things like that, things I reckon might be interesting to photograph or indeed look at during the month of August. Now, what I also do is I split this down by focal lengths and everything is measured on a full frame camera sensor. However, if you have a different camera, I do give equivalent focal lengths here. So hopefully no matter what your setup is, you'll find something to photograph throughout August. Now, with all that said, let's get into it. We're going to begin with deep sky objects and within deep sky objects, we're going to start at 100 millimeters focal length, which is nice and wide camera lenses, star trackers, things like that. And we're going to be over in Cepheus at this time of the month. And if you focus and um, point your rig at the star 27 Cepheus with this nice wide field of view, you could get the Bubble Nebula, Lobster Claw Nebula, Wizard Nebula and Elephant Nebula all in one field of view. So that's four prominent targets in one field of view. And even better, if you use something like a modified camera with a multi bandpass filter, such as a clip-in L Enhance or something along those lines, you'll really be able to drag all that nebulous data out, really pop it from the background sky and have quite an interesting image to look at. So that'd be my recommendation for 100 millimeters. At 200 millimeters, we're still in the constellation of Cepheus and this is NGC 7822. Now I'm pretty sure this probably has a familiar name, a colloquial name, but I haven't found it. So it's NGC. 7822. This is a really rather large nebulous region in the night sky. So nebulous meaning that you're going to want to use things like narrowband filters, ideally, really if possible. That's not to say you won't be able to get a picture with broadband, unmodified cameras, things like that. Just if you use something at least like hydrogen alpha filter, you'll be able to really pull out those fine details. A lot of people, including myself, enjoy doing HARGB images where they take a normal color photograph and then just put hydrogen alpha data on top to really those details out. So at 200 millimeters, go over to NGC 7822. Nice big nebulous target. We all like a big nebulous target, surely. At 500 to 600 millimeters now, again, a bit more midfield. We're gonna go over to the constellation of Cassiopeia, actually very close to the edge of Cassiopeia. And this is IC1848, the Sol Nebula. Sol Nebula is one of those that I really like. It's one of the first SHO images I ever took, and I often think it gets overlooked by the much larger, much more famous Heart Nebula right next door to it. So if you have 500, 600 millimeters, go over, give the Sol Nebula some love. Sometimes, you know, I think it just gets overshadowed a bit. Again, Nebula's target, really anything goes with it. Broadband, narrowband works, but I would definitely recommend at least trying to get some hydrogen alpha data on this if you're gonna put it into the broadband images, RGB, color photographs. So that would be my recommendation for that. Just a bit of hydrogen alpha in there, unless you're gonna go full SHO or even by color. Choices are endless with these kinds of targets. At 700 to 800 millimeters, I'm only realizing now afterwards how much I'm actually in the north of the sky. It's the Iris Nebula. This is C4 in constellation Cepheus. This is a very, very pretty reflection nebula. It's like a little flower. Obviously it's called the iris because it's a little bright spot outside of a, you know, like a pupil. It almost looks like there's a pupil of reflection nebula with a bright star in the middle of it. That's probably how it gets its name. However, it's relatively challenging actually. You can normally photograph this from any kind of sky because it's a reflection nebula, it's quite bright, but there's a lot of dust associated with the iris nebula. It's got dust all around it and everything like that. However, to really, really get that dust out, you're gonna need darker skies. So if you're actually going off to a dark sky site or something like that, then definitely consider the Iris Nebula. Being a reflection nebula, completely broadband target, narrowband filters aren't really gonna help you with this. So LRGB or just color cameras and light pollution filters if necessary. So that's what I recommend for 700 to 800 millimeters. At 1000 millimeters, we're gonna be moving over to a slightly different part of the sky now. At last, we're in the constellation of Vulpecula, or Vulpecula, however you wanna pronounce it. And this is NGC 6823. This is a nebulous cluster in the night sky, so it's got nebulosity and star clusters. And I've looked at this, I can't discern a shape from it, so 
Here's an amorphous blob of hydrogen alpha nebulous gas in the constellation Porpicola. So again, emission nebula, really rewarding things to target. I think this one might be quite dim, so you're gonna have to soak some integration time on this. Narrower and like three nanometer filters, things like that will really help pop it out of the background sky, especially if you're in heavy light pollution. However, any narrowband filters are going to help here. So just this big blob, well, I suppose it's a relatively small blob. When we look at it at 1000 millimeters, that's my recommendation. So at 1500 millimeters, now we're gonna swing back over to Cassiopeia to what is probably one of the more challenging targets in this constellation, and that is IC63, the ghost of Cassiopeia. Now, what, does, what makes this a challenging target? Well, it's a relatively small, quite dim, emission-based nebula with some reflection elements in it. So you need to use a mixture, a combination of filters really. And you've got the bright star Navi right there. So kind of like how the horse head is challenging because of Alan attack, the ghost of Cassiopeia is challenging because of Navi. It's just a bright star that usually is in the frame, especially at this focal length. So you need to kind of control that while you edit the rest of the photo. Could be challenging, but this is a really eerie looking target and could be for a rewarding target and a nice image at the end of it. So one and a half thousand millimeters, that is my recommendation to you. And finally at 2000 millimeters, we're over to the constellation of Cygnus now. Of course, Cygnus still getting a bit of love at this time of year. And this is one I've not personally imaged yet in Cygnus, but it is NGC 6888, the Crescent Nebula. The space brain, whatever you want to call it, it kind of looks like a space brain. Again, emission nebula, at this time of year, you really are getting a lot of emission our targets. There are always galaxies around, but this is what I'm interested in imaging. So the Crescent Nebula, again, small, nebulous region. Hydrogen Alpha is really going to be used to get the intricate shape and brain matter, whatever you want to call it, out of it. However, you're going to want to use other filters such as Oxygen 3, or even broadband to get a nice star field and the oxygen three would be used there's like a sort of glow that comes off of the brain when you look at some of the images that's the oxygen three so without the oxygen your hydrogen image might look a bit flat or it might be looking like it's missing something so just sprinkle some oxygen in there as well and you'll have a nice image of the space brain the crescent nebula and now on to plan a few planet hunters out there so just Quickly bear in mind, these are from my latitude within the United Kingdom, which is about 52 degrees, I think, if I remember correctly, about the Midlands area. So depending if you're higher or lower than me, it's going to change your viewing angle of these planets. Now, with that said, we've got Jupiter. That's going to be, an, that's going to be a planet you can take a photo of throughout the month. It is there already above 20 degrees. However, as the month goes on, it gets higher and higher and higher. The transit changes. It gets better and easier to photograph easier to photograph you know what i mean so there is jupiter we also have saturn available to image it is quite low so depending where you are in the world you might be able to image it you might not be able to image it you might photograph it through 20 degrees or lower depends you're probably going to want an adc atmospheric dispersion corrector in order to photograph saturn throughout august and finally from mid to late august we have neptune neptune is up there in the night sky as well Obviously, being one of the more further away planets, you're going to need a longer instrument or a bigger Barlow or a smaller chip camera or a combination of all three. Neptune, beautiful blue dot in our night sky. So if you have the means or the, the get up and go to try and image Neptune, go and have a go at it. Now onto events, there's a few to speak of. On the 12th of August, that's Friday, Saturn gets quite close to the moon close enough that a 100 to 150 millimeter camera lens on a full frame body should suffice if you want to take a photo of the two of them in one frame. Jupiter does the exact same thing. It's very close to the moon to the point where a 200 millimeter camera lens on a full frame body should suffice in taking a photo of the two of them next to each other. And finally, depending on when you count a new day beginning, either the night of the 19th or the beginning of the 20th, the morning of the 20th, should I say, around two to 3 a.m. if you look at the moon, with a 100 to 150 millimeter camera lens, you might actually notice that you can get Mars and the Pleiades in one image. Now, <laughs> I'm gonna to try to get this one myself personally, because this is gonna be an interesting image to take, but that is there as an option, and 
I personally think that would be an interesting photo to see if you could get Mars, Moon and the Pleiades. Yes, the scales are going to be all over the place. It may not be the most impressive image in the world, but three targets like that, oh, gets me excited just thinking about it. So that is another target suggestion for people with star trackers and camera lenses, for example. On to meteor showers now. We have the Persid meteor shower, which is still ongoing. It began around the 17th of July, and it goes on until about the 24th of August. It peaks the 12th and the 13th of August, and there is up to about 100 meteorites an hour. Unfortunately, the full moon is going to interfere with this, so you might not see as many meteors as one would hope, especially if the big lamp in the sky wasn't out, but it is what it is. Maybe next year might be better. But if you're still interested in trying to capture some meteors, get that camera out, get that long exposure out, and point it towards Perseus and see what you can get. And now speaking about the big lamp in the sky, we're going to go on to the moon phases now for August. Depending if you want to photograph beautiful small crescent moons, you like taking a photo of the full moon, or you want to know when to use hydrogen alpha filters, or just stay inside. So. The first quarter moon falls on the 5th of August and then the full moon is on the 12th of August and that's the sturgeon moon. The last quarter moon is the 19th of August and new moon is the 27th of August. So August's full moon can have several names. I've just called it the sturgeon moon and that's why it gets its name because the abundance of the sturgeon fish in lakes within North America. However, it can also be called the red haze moon due to atmospheric conditions during August as well as the green corn moon or the grain moon, probably due to some kind of harvest time. And that's it. That is the nice guy in August all wrapped up, done for another month of suggestions and ideas for you to photograph. I hope you found something useful in this video or it's given you some kind of inspiration or some ideas of what you can do with your kit. I say thank you very much for watching. Give it a thumbs up if you enjoyed the video. Hit the thumbs down button if you think I could have done better. I do see these ratings. Leave a comment if I've missed your favorite thing out to photograph and consider subscribing for more videos such as this. With that, thank you very much for watching. Hope you have clear skies. Keep looking up, keep them cameras clicking. I'll see you later.